Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Nate Kazmarek with the Federal Society's Article One Initiative. I uh, hope you all had a great Thanksgiving. Uh, I personally have sworn off eating anything for the foreseeable future, but uh, we're glad that uh, you could all join us for this luncheon. Uh, before we get started today, I just want to uh, have a repeat plug for our writing contest. Um, we are looking for younger writers under the age of 40 to su submit a maximum of 30 pages to us by January 5th of next year. The subject is uh, restoring a constitutional Congress. First prize is $5,000, second is $2,500, and there are two third place prizes of $1,000. If you want more information about the contest, it's on this flyer here uh, on our website, fedsoc.org slash AI contest. For today's panel, we're focused on a topic that is truly uh, an American tradition. While the term gerrymandering was first coined in the Boston Gazette in 1812, prior to the U.S. Constitution taking effect, redistricting was already being employed for political gain. In 1788, just after Virginia voted to ratify the Constitution and join the Union, it's alleged that former Governor Patrick Henry persuaded the state legislature to remake the 5th Congressional District, forcing James Madison to run against the formidable James Monroe. The ploy failed and Madison won. But the point is that partisan gerrymandering has been with us from our country's first days. Historically, congressional districts have been based on numerous factors, including population, geography, ethnic groupings, voting records, and the preferences, of course, of political parties. In the past, Congress has enacted legislation to address the topic directly, such as in 1842 with the Apportion Apportionment Act and the Voting Rights Act of 1965, as well as, as well as several other occasions. Since the 1960s, the courts have also been asked from time to time to intervene to review how certain districts have been drawn and the Supreme Court was asked to do so again this past month, as I'm sure many of you are aware, uh, in a case from Wisconsin titled Whitford v. Gill. So, have new technologies rendered redistricting too exacting and manipulative? Has modern gerrymandering increased congressional polarization? If so, how big a role does it play in congressional dysfunction compared to other issues? Is partisan control of district maps no longer desirable? Are there alternative system, systems for drawing maps that would be superior to our current system? How should Congress, the courts, or state legislatures address these issues, if at all? To help us with these and other important questions, we are fortunate to have with us two very knowledgeable experts. Um, and their abbreviated, abbreviated bi bios are as follows. We have with us, uh, at my far right, former Congressman Christopher Shays, who was first elected the House of Representatives in the Connecticut General Assembly, where he served from 1975 to 1987. He next served as a member of the United States House of Representatives and represented the 4th District of Connecticut from 1987 to 2009. During his 21 years in Congress, Congressman Shays served on the Government Reform Committee, Financial Services Committee, Budget Committee, and the Homeland Security Committee. He earned his MBA and MPA from New York University and his undergraduate degree from Principia College. We also have with us Jay Cost, who is an elections analyst, political historian, and a contributing editor at the Weekly Standard. His most recent book is A Republic No More, Big Government and the Rise of American Political Corruption. He received a BA with high distinction in government and history from the University of Virginia, and an MA in political science from the University of Chicago. Gentlemen, thank you both for joining us. Before I turn it over to Congressman Shays, uh, please note that following the panelists' remarks, we will have question and answer from the audience, so please think about the questions that you would like to ask our experts. With that, Chris, the floor is yours. Thank you. <clears throat> so, um, I am back in a place that I loved being at. I loved being an elected official, and I loved serving in the State House. I loved serving in Congress. It was my dream. Uh, to be in government when I was young, and by the time I was in college, I thought I might run for public office. So I'm someone who got to spend 34 years doing something I love. 
I think it's probably true for most members who serve, and I can tell you this, every one of them wants to make a difference. They want to leave uh, their country better than they found it. They want to leave their state better than they found it. They want to leave their local community better than they found it. And that's just a given that you need to understand. Collectively, though, sometimes you say, good grief, <laughs> you, you could fool me, uh, just based on you know, the failure to accomplish certain things. Um, when I think about gerrymandering, I'm going to think about it from the temp standpoint of the partisan advantage and also the ethnic racial uh, desire to create Latino districts, to create maybe an Asian district, to create African-American districts, and, and the consequence that, that comes from that. Um, but first, I want to say something about representation. So I have a community meeting, and it's about this size. Everybody's talking with each other. It was before they had uh, uh, your cell phones, so you were actually talking with each other. And a woman comes up to me as I'm just getting ready for the meeting. She says, Carson Shays, you come between me and my husband. <laughs> And everybody got very quiet. I didn't get nervous because I knew I didn't get between her and her husband in the way that some might have thought, but I didn't know what she'd say. And then she said the following. She said, you sent me a questionnaire and I filled it out and it took me 15 to 20 minutes to fill it out. When my husband came home, I told him he needed to do it. He didn't want to do it, but he did it. And she said he was complaining left and right. And then she said, he came back into the room where I was, he shook the questionnaire and questioned me on every one of my selections because he didn't agree with any of them. <laughs> now, um, I thought that's a, a man who probably never asked his wife what she thought about things. Um, <laughs> but I ask you this question, who do I represent in that family? Now, Sometimes, if they have the courage, some smart-ass woman will say the woman, of course. Um, but the fact is, I represent them both. And then the question, how do you represent two people with just totally different viewpoints? And this gets into the basic concern I have about gerrymandering. The way you do it, well, let me ask you this. What do you think, out there, what do you think is the most important skill or quality that you need to be a representative? And they'll give you $5,000 if you get it right. <laughs> we haven't talked about it, but no, t seriously, give me some guesses. Let's hear some words. Judgment, what? Judgment be one, okay, keep going. It's not the one I'm looking at. I mean, that, that's important. Listening, uh, that gets closer. Likeable, you, you, you know, it's easier to convince people if they like you. Um, it's also easier to get elected, what? Compromise, uh, yeah, I mean, that's all of these are great words. Uh, compassion is getting really close to the word I'm thinking of. Who said empathy? You did and you, I heard, it is empathy, it is empathy, it is empathy. I don't know what it's like to have red hair. I don't know what it's like to be a woman. Um, I used to not know what it was like to be bald. Um, I don't know what it's like um, to be a great athlete, I'm a good athlete, but I don't know what it's like to be black. I don't know what it's like to be Hispanic. I don't know what it's like to be poor. I don't know what it's like to be wealthy. All those things I don't know what it's like, but I better try to understand what it's like. I better try to understand why people think the way they do. My staff had me meet with a prostitute who was getting uh, AIDS so she didn't uh, spread um, AIDS. And I thought, this is interesting, it's a government program, and yet uh, uh, it's an illegal activity, it's a government program, but we had a reason to do it, didn't we? We didn't want her to spread AIDS. When I met with this woman, she wasn't very attractive. I wondered why she, how she could have a business like she did, but she made me laugh. She made me get, get weepy, I mean, teary-eyed. I thought, there by the grace goes, goes me, or any one of us. And my point was, I was trying to understand what was her life like? If I understand what the light, your lives are like, I may not vote exactly the way you want me to, but it shapes me. Now, um, you sometimes hear people say, oh, when he got elected, he said he would do this, this, and this. And five years later and 10 years later, he's a different guy. He's changed. 
Is that a criticism? They meant it as a criticism. Is it a justified criticism? No, it's a compliment. Your constituents are going to change you. They're going to teach you things you don't know. They're going to make you a more informed person. One reason I miss being in Congress is I learn new things every day and I met people I never would have met otherwise. So now this gets me to the point of gerrymandering and maybe you're getting a clue. A member uh, from Georgia who was a conservative told me he had about 35% African Americans. He said, I love the district. He said, because it was all new to me. I didn't know what it was like uh, to live the lives they did with the background that they had in the South. He said, every day it was just, it was just a learning experience. And I started to address some of their needs. And he said, those were bigger needs than some of my other part of the district. And I had some in my white community say, hey, you, what are you doing? All this stuff focused on African Americans. And he said, it's a simple answer. I represent them. And if you knew what I knew, you would do the same thing. But you don't know. You haven't had that experience. But you elected me. I got that experience. I spoke to that member about six years later and they had taken away his African-American district to create uh, a, a black district, an African-American district, and, it, and, it, and they got one more African-American. That's the benefit. The negative was he no longer learned about that experience. He no longer was sensitive to that experience and, and he no longer had the excuse to, to represent them in the same way, because his district be had become pretty white, not African-American. So good intentions have come some really negative consequence. You could look at Republicans who don't seem to be sensitive to African-Americans. They don't represent them. They're not faced, I mean, some do, but not many. Um, and you could say, well, you know, if they focus more on African-American districts, uh, and the, the needs there, maybe more would get elected, but they don't represent those districts. And, and so they lose out big time in helping our country shape the very diverse challenge we have. I had, um, when I was running for the Senate and lost the primary, I, I ran into a lot of Tea Party folks, and they would say, if you get elected, you gotta protect the Constitution. You cannot compromise. You've got to protect the Constitution. And I looked at them, and I knew they were incredibly well-meaning. But I said to them, the country failed because we couldn't compromise. We created the Constitution out of compromise, designed to create compromise, to give uh, our government the ability to be able to compromise. So the negative of gerrymandering politically is really obvious. It's totally obvious. The primary becomes more important than the general election if you have a partisan district, and too many members have partisan districts. When I was, um, uh, I went through two uh, times that we had to redesign the districts, uh, 92 and 2002, and we went from six to six. My district didn't change all that much because I was in the corner, and because you have five and there are four corners, you really don't have, um, you only have two districts that kind of are in play. And then um, when we went from six to five in 2002, we ended up with two members that had to, to contest against each other. And they worked real hard to make sure that each had a chance because in Connecticut, the legislature, uh, on a bipartisan basis tries to work it out. If they can't work it out, they bring in a third, a third person who probably has to swear on a Bible and everything else that they'll be fair to both sides. And if they still can't get an agreement, uh, they'll, they'll go to the, the courts and the courts will step in. The challenge you have with the courts is as much as you want, so I'm getting to the challenge of the solution side. There's no great solution. Um, and that is, I think of when it becomes, on real partisan issues, I think that um, in the race uh, that President Bush won the first time in a 5,000 vote difference, the Supreme Court partisan 
Democrat voted nine to nothing that it should be this way. And then when it came to the Congress, sadly, it was five and four, five Republicans siding with Bush and four siding with Gore. It didn't leave a good feeling for Americans because you would have liked to have thought, wouldn't it have been great if one of the Democrats had sided with Gore, I mean Bush, and one of the Republicans had sided uh, with, with, uh, with Gore. Uh, and, and it didn't happen. So there's a sense that even the, this, the, um, our judiciary can be a bit partisan. Uh, so uh, what's the bottom line? The bottom line is there are ways to make it less partisan uh, but what we have to sort out is, uh, to what extent do you want to create ethnic districts, black districts, uh, Latino districts? That inherently helps those communities in one way. They get a person of their own color, but it doesn't help educate all the members who are denied the opportunity to represent Africans and Latinos and so on. So they're, they're losing out in learning and growing and fighting for their causes. So we, uh, and then the other part of it is, since most of those districts tend to be, when you create that, you are creating a very intense democratic district when it's very ethnic. And you're creating very partisan Republican districts. Um, so when you hear sometimes, well, more people voted for the Democrat in the legislature than the Republicans, but the Republicans still hold the Congress. Part of that is gerrymandering for political reasons. Part of it is the good intention with the bad consequence of creating districts that are very, very partisan. So I, I look forward to a conversation on all this. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> well, thanks for coming, everybody. Can, can everybody hear me okay? Um, so I, I agree with Congressman Shays that gerrymandering is a problem. Um, it's a very old problem. Um, Nate had mentioned um, Patrick Henry um, trying to gerrymander uh, James Madison out of a district, and one of my favorite lines from writings of Th Thomas Jefferson was a, a note that he wrote to Henry in the 1780s that we need to pray fervently for Henry's death. Uh, they were not fans of each other. Um, <laughs> But it's an old problem. Um, another, uh, and, and it's an old problem that is um, part of a broader issue uh, that really is as old as government itself. It has to do with the allocation of political power. Um, and the allocation of political power is a very tricky thing to manage because power is not like wealth. Wealth grows over time, but power is constant. So power balances are inherently zero sum. Uh, that makes the allocation of power very, very nasty, potentially. Another example I like to refer to, and just to sort of give you a sense of how, you know, gerrymandering is just one species of the problem of allocating political power. Um, another very old example would be uh, the election of 1800 was uh, really one of the most important presidential elections in the country's history. It was not, by and large, done via ballots for uh, presidents. People didn't go to the ballot box and cast their ballot for Thomas Jefferson or John Adams. This was back uh, when the Electoral College was actually still a, a thing. Um, what do you but, mean by that? When, <laughs> when uh, you know, it actually when it actually the electors made their own choices about okay, what, gotcha. what to do okay. as opposed to just reflect their constituents. Um, and so in 1800, the Republicans, the Jeffersonians, had a huge victory um, in Pennsylvania, which was uh, a state that had gone for Jefferson four years earlier. They won uh, 13, 10 of 13 congressional seats, 55 of 78 state assembly seats, and uh, 10 of 13 congressional districts. They won six of seven state Senate contests, but they didn't take control of the state Senate um, because the state Senate wasn't really up for election that year. The state Senate was mostly elected in 1798, which was a good year for the Federalists. Uh, and the Federalists in the state Senate said, okay, we're gonna split the vote in half, the electoral vote. We're gonna split it in half or 
we just won't submit any ballots to the Electoral College whatsoever. So that was their bargaining position, and they held fast to that the entire time through. Now, that wasn't a fair uh, representation of the popular sentiment in Pennsylvania because the state had just swung pretty momentously for uh, the, uh, the Jeffersonians. But the Federalists had that sort of little pocket of power, and they used it for every inch that they could. Uh, and that really is just sort of the problem with political power, uh, is that nobody wants to give it up. Everybody wants to get as much political power for themselves as they can, and because power is not like wealth, that means what I get, you must lose. Um, gerrymandering is a species of that, of that general issue. Um, and I don't think it's debatable that gerrymandering has gotten worse over the last 30 years. I mean, if you go through and look at old um, maps of congressional districts from, say, the 1880s, you know, uh, the maps are, you know, they're sort of, they zig and zag, the districts zig and zag, but, the, the, but they don't, not with the level of precision that they do now. Can I just inject why? Because uh, back then, nobody wanted to admit it. Now they're proud to admit yeah. it as if they are serving their party well, so it's like they should be doing it. Yeah, and computers have been a major factor as well because they can get right down to sort of the precinct level. Um, and so I, I appreciate, as, as I think anybody would, right, um, anybody who is in favor of good government, uh, government that honestly reflects the interests of the people at large, um, I, I think that you know this is a problem, and I'm certainly not going to defend uh, the Wisconsin Republican Party's effort to gerrymander. I think that they sort of w were hoisted by their own petard and by being too clever um, and got themselves in trouble. Um, but I, I have qualms with uh, solutions, and for me, the qualms right now outweigh, the qualms about what to do about it outweigh the problem itself. So there's, there's a couple issues that I have that I just sort of want to run through. The first is, is that it's really hard to define in a precise way what is and what isn't a gerrymander, right? Uh, and this is sort of at the heart of the case of, of Gill versus Whitford that's been brought to the court. Uh, is that they have proposed, the, the Wisconsin Democrats have proposed a standard called the efficiency gap. And the efficiency gap basically um, says that, you know, however many votes one party gets in a state has to correspond in some respect to the percentage of seats that they get. So if a party gets 60 percent of the votes and only 30 percent of the seats, then that's a vi that that's an efficiency gap that's too low uh, and suggests a gerrymander. And certainly, I think at such extreme levels, um, certainly those, those, I think, are beyond dispute. But that's not really what the you know, actual gerrymanders tend to be. Um, and the gerrymanders tend to be much closer calls on the efficiency gap. And one of the problems that I have with the efficiency gap is that um, in, when it's an actual operation, I, I think it tends to spit out false positives and false negatives. So look at Alabama and Georgia in the 90s, Illinois in the, in the, in the teens in 2010. Uh, these are going to be, uh, you know, these are clear gerrymanders or clear non-gerrymanders, but the efficiency gap sort of works in the opposite direction. And the plaintiffs are basically asking for the efficiency gap to have the standard of proof. And that concerns me. Okay, um, it concerns me because, you know, is this really a very good metric of, of gerrymandering? Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. I think it needs a little more work, a little more research. Um, another, another problem or another concern that I have is what are the effects of gerrymandering, right? Um, and are they severe enough that we want the Supreme Court to begin to legislate or mandate how districts are drawn, because when we're doing that, we're really talking about a shift in the balance of power between the three branches of the government and also a shift in uh, federal-state relations to have the Supreme Court claim for itself the authority to, you know, invalidate uh, 
uh, state legislative districts or con congressional districts on, you know, not for Voting Rights Act violations, but just because the partisan skew is too much in one way or another. And that is a step forward for the court. That is growing uh, the power of the court. And I think it's important to bear in mind that this country is supposed to be a republic. And in a republic, the people are supposed to ultimately rule. And, you know, by that, the Founding Fathers did not usually intend for, you know, five unelected uh, jurists on the Supreme Court to rule in place of the people at large. Now, I'm not saying that that means the Supreme Court should do nothing. All I'm saying is that, you know, we should factor that in as a cost, right? Again, it gets to this sort of issue of political power. As the court's power to intervene in political disputes grows, the power of elected representatives has to necessarily shrink. So we, I think it's prudent to think through um, the actual negative consequences of gerrymandering. And, uh, and much like defining a gerrymander itself, I think it gets really difficult to drill down what the actual practical consequences are beyond these sort of ungainly maps that violate our general sense of fairness. Um, you know, for instance, I've seen people suggest that gerrymandering lends itself to partisan polarization. Um, I certainly think that that's an that's a, uh, 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 intuitive hypothesis. But polarization, ideological polarization, is actually a very difficult thing to map over time. It's very difficult to get some sort of standard that you can apply across, say, 50 years to say, well, this is a liberal in, say, 1960, and this is a liberal in 2017. Uh, it's actually really difficult. And I'll, I'll give you an example of that. Uh, by the typical sort of um, metric of polarization that's used these days is a metric called DW nominate, which is a good metric, but it has weaknesses like all these metrics do. And a lot of times when these metrics are used, their weaknesses are not fully considered. Um, and that's not a criticism of the people who designed DW nominate. I have enormous respect for them. Um, uh, uh, Poole and Rosenthal, enormous respect for them, enormous respect for the metric. But uh, like any metric, it's going to have its limits. And so an uh, example I'd like to give is that according to DW nominate, Gerald Ford, when he was a minority leader in the House of Representatives in the 1960s, would by today's standards be an incredible moderate, right? But Ford, in 1965, voted to recommit the Social Security Amendments of 1965. In other words, he voted against Medicare, right? Meanwhile, while congressional Republicans, who today are seen to be substantially to the right of where Ford was, have you know promulgated the Ryan Plan, which endeavors to save Medicare, transforming it, yes, but to save it. So, I mean, in a certain sense, I certainly think that Ford was more moderate than congressional Republicans are today. But this this sort of presents the problem with making long-term comparisons about ideology, and therefore to make any meaningful claims about the level of, of polarization. I don't, can, can I jump in? Just sure, to, of I, course. I don't see how relating uh, someone's views 40 years ago to now is dealing with relating someone's views today. The, the, the fact is that we know that Democrats are going to play to a Democratic audience that is pretty liberal, however you define liberal today. Republicans are going to play to, uh, to the far right, frankly. Uh, and I don't care how you describe them compared to the past. They are totally at odds with each other and not communicating. I, I, so just to make another point, I, the American people, I think, are, there's, if you did a bell curve, liberal, conservative, they're kind of somewhere in the middle, maybe leaning a slightly to the right. If you did one in Congress, it would be an, an inverted bell curve. It would be like this, with a whole group in Congress this way, Democrats, and a whole group Republicans thinking this way. 
That's, I think, the, the isn't that the more relevant comparison? Well, I, I certainly think so. Uh, but, you know, I'm sort of responding to arguments that say gerrymandering has, has sort of created more conservative congressmen and more liberal congressmen over time. Um, and I just, I, 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 I'm sympathetic to that. I think it's an intuitive argument. Uh, my, my point is that it's just really difficult to track ideology over time. That part I agree with. OK. Um, so another issue that I point out with in terms of the effect of gerrymandering is, is the skew in votes to seats, right? Because the idea being that a really solid gerrymander is going to enable a party to get way fewer, you know, get more seats, even if they don't get, you know, as many votes as the opposition. And that is a relatively rare phenomenon in American elections, uh, at least on a federal level, which is where my primary sort of knowledge basis is, right? That in 2012, uh, Republicans were able to retain a majority despite the fact that Democrats won more votes. But that is really sort of an exception to the rule and might have something to do with the unique coalition that Barack Obama was able to uh, bring out, particularly in otherwise uncontested uh, districts in the in the rural South. Now, again, all of this is just to sort of um, push back on this sort of idea of like it's really hard. Is my only the point that I'm trying to make here is that it is really hard to quantify the pro the, the problems of gerrymandering. Um, and I would say also as relates to uh, you know, these issues of, uh, you know, sort of like, even if we can identify actual changes in time, it's really difficult not only to identify, well, what is, you know, how do we actually measure gerrymandering? There's no good consensus on that. But also there's sort of federally mandated gerrymandering in the form of the 82 amendments to the Voting Rights Act. So it gets difficult to sort of say, well, this is, this prop, this ish thing that we don't like is due to partisan gerrymandering as opposed to, you know, maybe measurement error, maybe, you know, uh, Congressman, as you were suggesting, you know, nomination battles in, in, uh, if for, for, for Congress itself tend to be dominated by the ideological polls. You know, so what is actually, what is gerrymandering actually causing, right? It's, I, I, the more that I've studied this issue the over, over the years, the, the, the more I've struggled to actually come up with an answer. Uh, and then the final thing that I would suggest. An answer to the solution or an answer to whether it exists? Not, not to whether it exists, but the, an answer to exactly how it exists, okay. the details of it, right? Because, of course, what the court is being asked to do in Gill versus Whitford is apply a particular standard uh, to solve one particular definition of gerrymandering to, to remedy uh, a, a particular problem. And that's, that's where I get tripped up is sort of on these particulars. And I would just sort of make a, a con sort of a concluding observation that relates especially to the Supreme Court, right? Because the Supreme Court is being asked to implement a standard of gerrymandering that is note called the efficiency gap, which is sort of to close the gap between votes versus seats in a given state, right? It, on the, it, at this point, for now, it's for state legislative races, but I'm sure that eventually it will migrate. If the court opens the door to this, they'll walk through it eventually and it'll apply it to Congress as well, right? Sort of votes versus seats. Uh, now, that is certainly a good way to organize uh, congressional districts, state legislative districts, but it's not the only way. Right? Um, you know, we could organize, draw district lines. Perhaps the ideal would be to uh, create communities of interest, perhaps to create um, geographical compactness, perhaps to encourage competitive races. Um, you know, and if we start advocating those sorts of ideals, what we're going to see is that a lot of times you can build a very earnest map. Uh, that that tries to draw compact communities of interest, but is going to be an efficiency gap violation. Um, and the efficiency gap is actually um, a backdoor to proportional representation, 
like what the uh, Euro European parliaments typically have, right? Uh, because what the efficiency gap is going to do basically is if you don't create in your state, the farther you get from, you know, X percentage of the vote to X percentage of the seats, the more likely you're going to come under scrutiny. And that's going to push um, American legislative districts towards proportional representation, which maybe we should do. Maybe that's something that we should do. But the question it, that troubles me is that is, is this something that a five vote majority on the Supreme Court should mandate for the entire country in a republic, right, of the people, by the people, for the people. It's not of Anthony Kennedy, by Anthony Kennedy, for Anthony Kennedy. I have concerns about that. Um, and the final point that I'll make is that the, um, the efficiency gap has not undergone sufficient analysis among scholars. So it has a scholarly pedigree. But at this point, as far as I can tell, it's only been subject to two peer-reviewed articles. And there have been, there's been scholarly pushback to it. So other scholars have suggested that, no, this actually creates uh, problems. You know, uh, one, one uh, essay I was just reading a couple days ago by Olivia Guest and Brad Love, and Love is from the Uni University College Park in London, uses um, computational modeling to decrease the space between constituents. And they create all sorts of really, you know, interesting defensible maps that this is a completely different standard than the efficiency gap and would create, you know, efficiency gap problems. So I have a lot of concern with um, the Supreme Court sort of upending this and endorsing the efficiency gap because I don't think it's ready yet. I have a, enormous respect for uh, the people who've put the efficiency gap together and its advocates and sort of the expert witnesses before the Supreme Court who have been advocating for the efficiency gap. I, I have enormous respect for them, but you know, Science and social science should work on the basis of consensus at least before it acquires the force of law. And I don't think that the efficiency gap is ready to acquire the force of law. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Congressman Shays, would you like to uh, offer some additional remarks? You no, know, I, I, we're running out of time, so I'd like to throw it open to the floor. Okay, very good. Um, questions from the audience? Please. Uh, questions or comments, right? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. I have a question for Jay on the uh, efficiency gap. Yeah. How would that work with third parties? So, for example, you have Green Party or Libertarian Party getting five percent in a state legislature. If it's a hundred-member state legislature, that technically should be five seats. But there's no one district that would have that concentration. Yeah, they have. There's workarounds to that. That actually speaks to one of the sort of problems that I have. I mean, this sort of digs us really deep into the woods. Right, but there are different ways to compute the efficiency gap. Even if we accept the efficiency gap as the standard, there's different ways to compute it. One of the differences being along those lines, and that can spit out different results. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's sort of an in-the-weeds computational matter. They, they have the, 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 they've come up with the answers to that. But yeah, that's a good question. Congressman Shays, one of the questions I was curious about was, you know, you were in Congress for a good, good while you observe changes. Where do you rank uh, gerrymandering uh, in the list of things that are driving the polarization? Which I, I, I think this to is earlier. the most serious problem uh, without an ideal solution. Um, you know, it would be nice if there was a cost for, cost for bad behavior, but there doesn't appear to be anymore, and that rests with the general public. Uh, Tom DeLay. Uh, I, I made the point earlier, at one time you never wanted to admit you were gerrymandering because most people thought, well, that ain't fair, and that ain't right, and so I don't like this person who's suggesting we do it. Now it's gotten to the point like, you're, you gotta protect us, we're a tribe, and you gotta do it. And so Tom DeLay goes to Texas in the middle of the 10 year span and now that the Republicans control the legislature and they redistrict, and when I say he, it was the legislature there, but he, he was kind of leading the charge and there are many nice things about Tom, but he thought this was a good thing to do. And it wasn't, it was, it was totally gerrymandering within the 10 years. So he made it, you know, he cut it down even, it was just an obvious attempt to, um, to distort the political process. That's what gerrymandering is. It distorts the political process. 
And we, we have enough problems. I mean, think of this. How would you feel if you really, I've met some California folk, and uh, they said they're from California. Well, that's great. You're from California, you have two senators. Um, I'm next door to Delaware, and they have two senators. They have one congressman, I think you have 55 congressmen. So when we talk about democracy, we can't, we can't you know, ignore the fact that we have a unique kind of democracy. Let's not make it worse by accepting gerrymandering and rewarding politicians who advocate it. But well, some might argue that there really isn't any way to take the subjectivity out of the process no matter what format you select, right? Well, you know, a good, sometimes just a good, honest discussion among us is a helpful thing. Um, understanding that when you're creating an African-American district, it has consequence. So in that sense, you're gonna have to accept it. So don't blame someone for the fact that now you've got uh, a bit of a Republican and a Democratic uh, um, kind of gerrymandered district. Um, so, I mean, I, we don't even have discussion anymore. It, it's, it's, the Articles of Confederation failed, so we had the Constitution. I have fear that people will begin to say this government is failing, and I don't know what we're gonna end up with. Because right now, it's not a criticism, you know, in, it's a criticism with a recognition that I understand why it's happening. But there's nothing much happened in the last 20 years. Now, I was there part of those 20 years, so I'm saying it to myself as well. Think of the problems that are not being addressed and will not be addressed, which is another thing. Why do you need 60 votes in the Senate? When they say Republicans control everything, they don't control everything. They need 60 votes to get something done for almost everything in the Senate. And, and then if you have a party, Republicans didn't want to help Democrats, Democrats don't want to help Republicans. These are the kinds of discussions we should be having. We're not. Uh, and with all due respect for the members love, I'm sorry, I'll just get, members love to jump onto something they can speak to. So right now we're speaking about sexual harassment or we'll speak about abortion, or we'll, you know. But, but we're not solving really serious national problems that affect the future of mankind. And I understand I'm being sensitive, I'm being unsensitive, I, I guess, by talking about sexual harassment, but now the only people you see on TV and the only discussion is that. Good grief. Well, thank goodness for the Article One initiative to host these discussions. Exactly, right? and, good, and good that you're here. Yes, we do have a, a lot of staffers here in the office who'd like to ask questions, so <clears throat> please go ahead. Oh, sure. Um, so a team from Brown <coughs> University recently published a paper, uh, a team of computer scientists from Brown University published a paper in which they redrew the, the electoral districts in the United States to account for um, perfectly equal rep representative, re representative districts. So you would have districts with perfectly equal population in them down to maybe like a margin of error of five people. Well, that has to happen now. Right. Yeah. So, so is that the solution? Just sort of take it, take it out of the political process and just give it to a machine and say, so the machine spits out the, the perfect districts for the perfect boundaries and everything's sort of very pretty and sort of organized? Or, or, or do we need to, to have a more involved process with sort of people who know about this? Sort of getting into this and in political input as well. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, well, I, I'm, just, I'm gonna put my philosophical priors on the table here just so everybody sort of knows where I'm coming from. Because I, I come from a, when you ask that question, it resonates with me in a very specific way. I consider myself to be a civic Republican in the mold of, you know, Madison, right? Uh, and, you know, Republican government is, was, um, you know, Lincoln, I think, put it best when he said it was of the people, by the people, for the people, right? So I get very nervous when we start talking about the Supreme Court taking control of things. Um, and look, I think that one of the, one of the well, issues... How about machines? Well, yeah, I'll get to that. So um, <laughs> I think one of the issues here, right, is that um, we don't have a neutral third party, right? That's the problem, right? We don't have a neutral third party, so let's just give it over to a neutral third party. But the question that we have to ask on the other end is whether that neutral third party, be it a machine, rep reflects the people's values. This is, I think, more than anything else, the point that I want to impress, is that gerrymandering seems like a scientific issue. And to some degree, it is. But it is also a question of political values. 
And that has to be decided in a deliberative Republican Democratic setting. Because like, like I said before, what is the ideal standard? Is it communities of interest? Is it geographical compactness? Is it, um, is it uh, you know, something like a low efficiency gap, okay? These are not questions that a computer is gonna be able to answer for us. And similarly, uh, this is the concern that I have by kicking this up to the Supreme Court and basically, because we know how eight of the nine are gonna vote, right? And in a country of 330 million people, I have, uh, I have qualms about one guy, we're gonna do what he values, right? Because that's what Gill versus Whitford's gonna come down to, is what does Anthony Kennedy want to do, right? And so, uh, because the issue here is what's the ideal, right? We can all agree that gerrymandering is bad, and we can agree on the specifics that I don't like the Wisconsin map, okay? I don't like it, personally, okay? I'll stipulate that. I think it's a pretty gross gerrymander. Right? But what do we want it to be? Okay? It could be a bunch of different things. There are a bunch of alternative ideals. And the only way to come up, come up with some sort of consensus is to keep this within the, the political sphere, as messy as politics is. But that's what Republican government is. Right? It's, it's politics. It's <laughs> debate. Yes, it's messy and yes, it's ugly. But these are, these are about values and we need, to, we need, as a people, need to come up with a consensus about what do we want our districts to look like. We can admit, we don't want it to look like that. Okay? That's fine. But that's not what Gill versus Whitford, that's not what the efficiency <laughs> gap's going to do. It's not just saying that's wrong, it's saying this is right. And the, quest, the worry that I have is whether or not that actually is what we want. I don't think it is, or at least I think that's in competition with other things we want. And we haven't had a sufficient debate among the people at large. Right here in front, sir. Yeah, so um, he asked about uh, speaking more about comp compactness <laughs> and uh, communities of interest as sort of alternative standards, right? So uh, a standard of compactness would just be uh, to sort of minimize the distance between uh, two con average constituents within a district, right? To keep the aggregate, in, in every district, the average distance between constituents to keep that as low as possible, right? Like a block. Right. Um, communities of interest, I'll give you an example of that. The city of Erie, so I'm from western Pennsylvania, if you go up north to the city of Erie. Uh, so the city of Erie used to be in a congressional district all of its own, right? And Erie, however, is a democratic town that's surrounded by Republican rural areas. So what the Republican Party did in the 2010, uh, after the 2010 census, they cracked it, right? There's sort of ways to gerrymander, one's called cracking and one's called packing. Right, cracking is they basically stick stick the line straight down the middle of the district. They put half of it in sort of my congressional district, and then they put the other half in central Pennsylvania. So that would be sort of distorting a community of interest because the people in Erie are simul similarly situated, have a similar interest, uh, and therefore there's an argument there that they should be represented in a similar way, right, or by by the same members. That my concern, though, is that in certain places, like in places where you have very large, uh, in, for all practical purposes, the problem gets to in, 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 place, in states with very large urban areas. You start creating community, you start building districts based on communities of interest in those states, you're going to run afoul of the efficiency gap. Because the, the communities of interest in, say, Illinois, you're going to create a bunch of districts that are like 70-30 Democrat, but then the remainder of the state is going to be like, you know, 55-45 Republican, right? Which is why the efficiency gap, um, it, it, the, the Illinois gerrymander in 2011 was one of the most epic gerrymanders of the, of the cycle. It's sort of up there with like Ohio and Maryland, what they managed to do in, in Illinois. But it doesn't violate the efficiency gap because they sort of were playing, because a neutral, a neutral map in Illinois based on communities of interest would have spiked the efficiency gap. So they, they gerrymandered around communities of interest and got their efficiency gap number way down. This is a sort of trade-off that really concerns me. 
right? And it concerns me that the Supreme Court is now taking up this. And I am not convinced. This is the other thing. When we talk about the Supreme Court, they have skills and they, they have things that they're not skilled at. This is the sort of issue where, you know, the court, I, I am dubious of their expertise on this, and that's not a criticism of them. And they wouldn't want me telling you about the tradition of First Amendment. I'm not a lawyer, right? I mean, you know, we all have our expertise. <coughs> this is a sort of area where the closer you look at this, the trickier it gets. I would argue that they could figure it out. Okay, uh, this gentleman over here on the right. Uh, uh, yes, sir. Paul Carlson with Maryland uh, Research and Reform Commission as well as Cato. And so you're well, an expert. Well, um, and we looked at a lot of the issues uh, that have uh, been raised. One is that machine algorithms uh, do not do a good job of drawing lines. Uh, uh, they will give you diagonal and curved lines. They will um, not follow people's intuition of uh, where you're going. The lines are with these people who don't know what district they're living in and, and various other topics. Um, I'd like to push back a little bit on the nihilist view that there are no objective standards uh, for perfect gerrymandering and that there are no judicial enforceable standards because um, if you look around the 50 cents. A little louder, just so. Okay, yeah, if you look around the 50 cents, uh, there are a lot of things already in place in state law. There are compactus rules uh, which are enforced by the judiciary in many, many states. There are rules against splitting counties. Uh, we're saying that large counties have to be split before small ones. Again, on the books for many, many years, and judicially enforced to strike down gerrymandering. So we know that some of these things do work. Uh, uh, I would say that community of interest is not one of those things because uh, judges have not been at all effective at objectively figuring out what is community of interest. It is totally subjective. On that one, you're right. But, uh, my question, when you get to the Supreme Court and constitutionalize the question, is why are they trying to constitutionalize a, state, uh, uh, a standard that no state has ever used, so far as I can tell? Why don't we let it percolate and let 10 states adopt the efficiency now and see how it does before trying to constitutionalize it, even on uh, the, the, the players' uh, own terms? Is it, is it possible to come to that conclusion? Well, my own, and I'm sorry to add a parallel here, but I, I suspect that the plaintiffs, um, or that, that, that the um, uh, efficiency gap people will not convince uh, Justice Kennedy because I think he will see uh, the uncertainties, he will see that it will not be applied the same way uh, by the public and Democratic judges. I think they would have been much better off to come up with something like compactness that has worked well in the states for a long time and just take that one bite and try to constitution. And as to what state do you think does it the best? Is it Iowa? Um, well, Iowa has a unique procedure to hand it over to the Civil Service uh, Legislative Analysis Bureau. And we decided not to recommend this in Maryland for various reasons. One of which is that Maryland may not have the uni universal trust in its legislative. Uh, the other thing is that our Legislative Service Bureau uh, bowed out and said, under no circumstances, I mean, that's the district thing because everyone will hate us. But um, I, Iowa has some good rules. Uh, Colorado puts a compactness test total perimeter into its state constitution. Um, a number of states use another mathematical formula, which again, uh, it's very objective. Judges will come out exactly the same way if you give them one of the two or three recognized efficiency formulas. And at least you won't have to worry about the judiciary being as politicized right. if you were giving them uh, and and fast see, now that's the sort of thing, yeah, I, I, see, that's the sort of thing that I, I like. Because if it's the state legislature that's coming up with these rules, or if it's some public commission that's created by the people specifically for that purpose, then it's something that gets kicked through the political process, at least in some way, so that we can start debating values and standards and, and our preferences and things. And in fact, if I'm reading the Constitution correctly, the U.S. Congress institutionally <coughs> has quite a bit of latitude to um, step into this area without making it a uh, Supreme Court constitutional question yeah. and um, begin direction with states to follow certain good practices. And I wouldn't say, I, I, I wouldn't say I, maybe I, uh, I was, um, overspoke a little bit. I wouldn't, because I, I wouldn't characterize myself having a nihilistic viewpoint on this. I think that there is traction to be gained with um, uh, in dealing with mit mitigating the effects of, of gerrymandering. My, my point was really just that it's, 
it's a sticky problem and then it has to be dealt with. Um, I mean, and I, I would sort of contrast, right, the sort of process that you're describing, which is, you know, on the ground in states, written into the law itself, it goes through vetting and, it, you know, it's sort of deliberated. Whereas what the court is being asked to do is sort of apply this standard, like you said, has never been applied before. It's just invented in, in it was just invented in 2014, it was the first time that, that this paper was published in legislative studies quarterly. Um, and I think ultimately, you know, I think your comments speak to sort of the point that I, I was I was endeavoring to make, which is that there's a lot of value there. There are values at stake, and so for this to go through the political process as you described it, I think the more that we can we can do that, the better the the, the better it'll be. Some might argue that there's a timing issue, right? That they're pushing the efficiency gap uh, through uh, in anticipation of the next census. And yeah. And maps being drawn again. Well, in this case, they're just as kind of return. Yeah. Lots of speculation. You all hear right. that? Make the point less. Uh, or, or in anticipation of Justice Kennedy's retirement after another term or two. Right. And I, I mean, I don't want to be, I, I'm not trying to, I'm not casting aspersions here. Um, uh, but, you know, because I have a lot of respect for the people who put together the efficiency gap sort of. Uh, the efficiency gap standard. It's, and, and from a political science perspective, it's an interesting standard. I mean, it's an interesting metric, right? But why are we being asked to consider this metric as opposed to others? Because it, it's good for the plaintiffs in Wisconsin, mm -hmm. is, is why we're being asked to consider this, as opposed to what you were suggesting, right? Because there are other alternatives. So why is this the standard that is being Crawford, why is this distinct, this the standard that the lower courts have sort of, you know, signed off on? I mean, why why this? And the answer is, is because this standard puts in stark relief uh, how bad the Republicans behaved in Wisconsin, and without sort of, you know, I'll stipulate that they behaved pretty badly in Wisconsin. But that is is that a sufficient reason to justify selecting the efficiency gap over any other alternative? I'd like to just put uh, one comment in deference to Tom DeLay, who I kind of went after. Because his argument, which I now remember, was that the Democrats so gerrymandered the district yeah. just before then that he was just trying to equal it out. Obviously, yeah. it was more than equaled out. But, but the point was he was stepping in because it was so outrageous under the Democrats before. Go ahead, Jim. Sir. I, I, I know you sort of touched on this. What is your opinion about these so-called commissions that have been set? California is the best example. It's an option. Have this nonpartisan, supposedly nonpartisan group. They pay them well. <laughs> and I'm, I, 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 I'm thinking that what Las Vegas did years ago to try to make sure that the um, casinos were being honest, uh, they paid one person the equivalent of, say, $5 million today uh, to do that, and so he couldn't be bought off. He, he would keep his $5 million. But in, in some sense, you would need, there are people who could do it. Um, and we had the, the master who decided who would get the huge sums of money when 30,000 people were uh, annihilated at, at, you know, at ground zero. That master decided how each person would get, nine million here, eight million, five million. And people respected his, his position. And if you could find people that both sides could respect, that would be huge. So it's who you put on the commission that matters. Jane, did you have any further comment about? Yeah, California? you know, I, I mean, I think in theory, a commission is okay. Um, uh, I didn't like. I don't like what California did. I think that they they drew they drew maps to protect incumbents, which is another another problem too. I mean, it's uh, partisan gerrymandering. That isn't necessarily the only type of gerrymandering. I mean, you can draw maps to make sure that all everybody gets reelected, and so that government becomes resistant to any change. Um, so I, so true. I mean, and look, I think that now I, I'm reminded of this sort of um, line from Federalist Ten, where Madison is talking about, you know, Madison's belief was that what is really necessary in a Republican government, he, he told George Washington that what Republican government ne really needs is a neutral umpire, somebody to fairly call the balls and strikes, right? 
And Madison analogizes the legislative proceedings to that of a courtroom, right, where the, you know, they're sort of going to distribute government tax burdens and government benefits, and it's it sort of, you know, there's a, a certain requirement uh, that is, that, um, you know, is necessary uh, to fulfill the demands of justice, right? But Madison points out that the problem with the legislature is that the parties to the different claimants are themselves the judges, right? That this is the inherent problem with legislative politics is this sort of inevitable conflict of interest where we don't have a neutral arbiter, right? Uh, so now is that an area where, oh, well, maybe what we need is a king, right? Because that was sort of the, the acknowledgement that the, you know, the, in the classic understanding of the British system of government, the king was the one who had an interest that was set apart from the people and so that he couldn't be corrupted in any way. But Madison points out that, well, you know, sometimes the king can turn against both parties. You know, the king is free to do whatever he wants. And I, so I don't think there's any, and Madison's point was is that there's really no sound and sure solution, right? So I mean, there, there's an appeal to kicking things over to a, some commission that's independent from the from politics. But if that commission produces a result that is, you know, like what California did, what are you going to do about it? I mean, you know, I, and I think that gets to the the basic sort of fundamental challenge with gerrymandering is that is that because it involves the allocation of political power itself. You're never going to get a process that is pure, that is completely objective, that isn't in some degree self-interested, right? Um, and that's sort of why, like, you know, when uh, Walter Olson was saying just now, you know, like, let's kick it down to the states for a decade and see what they come up with, and maybe we can get a sense of what best practices are we can compare and contrast. Because there's going to be, you know, some strategies are going to be better than others, you know. I mean. Commissions have their merits, but they also have their limits. I, I remember in uh, 1992, the, the basic determination was that none of us would be hurt, the six members of Congress, that we were all protected, so relax and go back to Washington. Yes, sir. So I am not an expert on uh, gerrymandering. Uh, so I was hopeful that um, we could maybe talk just a second on some of the, the basics. So. Uh, I know we have a census. My, my question is, can each legislature independently determine uh, when they want to redistrict for that given state? And, and uh, are states pretty much just waiting for the next census to be completed before they redistrict? Or Let me give a stab, and this would be an ignorant answer, and then he can correct me. Uh, nobody wants to go through this, so we're forced to go through it every 10 years. If, if we didn't have a census, we wouldn't do it for 30 years. Then, then the so we should anticipate another batch of redistricting. Yes, that's what happens. The, the census determines um, how many, uh, and the census is required by the Constitution, so there's no wiggle room around it. The census determines how many congressional districts each state gets, and then after that, the Supreme Court has has ruled ruled in the 60s. Out of the out of the 335, in other words, Congress sets 335. And once you determine that, then the census decides how it goes in the states, correct? Right. Yeah. Or 435. I did. I 430. Said, yeah. 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 So what happens is, is that the, the, the <laughs> census will, you know, take, take, we're going to, the census will decide, well, we're, Pennsylvania is going to lose two seats. Texas is going to pick up two. So Pennsylvania then has to redistrict. Texas then has to redistrict because they got to draw. They got to redraw the, the maps, and then. But then on top of that, there's the additional burden um, that in the '60s the Supreme Court mandated one man, one vote. So every district has to be roughly equal in population. So if there's been migrations within states as well, that you might have to start redrawing lines. Like that's going to be a problem in in Pennsylvania. I mean, that's been consistently what's happened is that the center and western portion of the states have, has been losing population relative to the east so they got to redraw the lines every year and then on top of our every decade and then on top of that they're losing seats overall so everything has to be redone the northeast loses a lot yeah historically yes next question um just a comment and then a question um the that, just a comment and then a question that um that Supreme Court case that established the one person, one vote um, was Reynolds v. Sims. 
Um, and before that, there were states that hadn't redistricted since 1901, I think was the most egregious, I think it's Tennessee, um, was the one that had redistricted the most in the past, if that wasn't very good grammar, but was the one that had um, not redistricted in the longest period of time. Yeah, there were all sorts of games that they could play. Uh, New York was infamous for the games that it played because they didn't have to apportion, uh, seats didn't have to be equal in population. So what the New York Republican machine did, because back in the 19th century, New York actually had a Republican machine. Um, they would take the, the, the Irish and Italian and Polish immigrants in New York and that would boot, but you know, at one point New York had something like 45 electoral votes. But that they would, they would draw the map so that all the seats were all upstate, which is where all the Republican Yankees were. Uh, you know, so you can't play games like that anymore. They used there used to be you know, before one man one vote. You could do a lot. You could do a lot more now. I mean, the gamesmanship now is is one thing, but back then uh, you could do more. And ultimately, what that would do, what that tended to do, was uh, bias the Congress toward rural interests over urban interests and toward sort of old stock Yankee. That was German. the Warren Court. That was the Warren yeah, Court. Warren Court did so many really controversial things that were, I mean, you know, Miranda uh, rights and reading rights and so on. It was fascinating, but in Connecticut, I think this uh, court case decided, Connecticut in the state legislature, Darianne that had 15,000 population had two members in the General Assembly and New Haven had two. So, I mean, it was just you know, a big urban area still had the same number as a smaller. Yeah, Rhode Island did stuff like that too, and it was a way for political machines to buy up. You could basically pay voters, like literally give them money. To There's get still them. signs in the South, I'm told, that say impeach or Warren. <laughs> he died a long time ago. Um, but my question is um, for Congressman Jay. Um, how much do you think during during his Well, you know, it, it, it was a difficult state to gerrymander because we, we have four corners. We only have five. We have five members. And so there's just, so it, it wasn't an easy one. And, and so really what happened there was uh, in order to keep the congressmen happy, they just made sure that all the congressmen had pretty much the same kind of votes that they had before. And candidly, I didn't complain with that. Um, I think they could. It, it's a it's a district that's still somewhat of a swing district. Um, uh, but the beauty of my having that district for me personally was that I got the views of by having a so-called swing district, you get the views of so many people, and so you have a much broader range. And I would argue that the people that made government work were those in swing districts, because we were the ones who. I mean, I supported the. The, the uh, crime bill under under President uh, Clinton, um, I support gun control. In fact, I was the lead person on that. In my district, even though I had very partisan Republicans, very partisan Democrats, I had a lot of people in the middle. There's this wonderful statistic when Bush won his first or second race, and we're forgetting, but they determined 29% were red, 29% were blue, and 42% were purple that had no representation. And that's kind of what I feel we're ending up with. The vast majority of people, know, and by the way, we haven't talked about this, a little different, but the other way the votes are distorted is Republicans and Democrats are the only ones who ultimately get to decide who participates in the debates in the end, in September. And if you're not part of the presidential debates, you want to play it. And so there were some very inf influential people who would have run had they felt certain that they could qualify. But the presidential commission is comprised of these Republicans and Democrats. That's why when other countries look at us, like you know, we criticize the Ayatollah for saying eight people can run for president. He says, well, that's great. Only two can run in your country. Other questions? Well, one question I wanted to ask about was the. Are we all okay on time? I just want to make yes, sure. Yes, we. Any of you are free to leave at will. And thank you. Thank for you for coming. Yes. God bless you. Take care.
Uh, just one quick question about self-sorting. I don't know if we've talked much about that. Is that more of a modern trend? You know, the people have greater mobility. They can move to cities or move out of cities based on political viewpoints. Is it something that's uh, exacerbating the gerrymandering problem naturally more so than it would have in the past, or is it a push on that? Well, you know, self-sorting is, I mean, obviously there's greater mobility now. Right, so that lends itself to self-sorting. Uh, however, uh, you know, if you go back and look at the party system, basically between the Civil War and the Great Depression, the two political parties were basically just regional coalitions that were more or less relitigating the Civil War in the political field. Right, so the South was. Uh, you could, you, I mean, you could basically draw a line from Maryland west, right? And a everything south of the Mason-Dixon line, so that includes like Vandenberg, uh, Indiana, and southern Illinois, and you know, this is why Missouri was until recently the quintessential st swing state, because Missouri was a little bit north and a little bit south and a little bit east and a little bit west, right? <laughs> Um, and it's, it's really remarkable, actually, to look at, say, the election. If you look at the congressional map of, you know, 1896, you're going to see it's all, it's just a sea of blue, because back then, this, uh, by the way, the red versus blue thing was created in 2000. Before that, it was actually the blue were the Republicans. So it's, for, for those of us who like old maps, it's incredibly confusing. And not <laughs> Right, because then I have to like reset myself. Like, okay, what? When was this map created? Right. Uh, so I'm going to impose my confusion on all of you now. So if you look at a map of like the 1896 congressional district election, it's going to be like a whole sea of blue in the north, blue Republican, and then a sea of red Democrats in the south, because the Democrats at that point, you know, basically between the Civil War, the Democrats were more or less Southerners. Southerners and then the Irish, and then later on the Italians and the Poles. And the, that, and that, the that's why Kennedy had to appeal to so many Democratic governors in the South. Right. And why uh, his people didn't want him to uh, acknowledge Martin Luther King in jail. Right, exactly. Uh, and some of the uh, Kennedy's people did it anyway. Yeah. yeah. Can so, go, oh, I'm yeah, sorry, go on. Oh, um, so, you know, so we have something now that is sort of like self sorting, but I actually don't think that that's fair to say what it is. I think that instead we have geography is now a, a function of socioeconomic status, right? So you have sort of the poor inner urban areas, and then you have the sort of upscale, gentrifying urban areas, and then you have uh, the suburbs and you have rural places, right? And these are going to be because congressional districts are anchored in geography. I mean, they just have been since, since really since the beginning, right? Ge geography has been the anchor of house districts. And, and now, nowadays, geography is a major factor in, you know, socioeconomic status. So I don't think it's something like, you know, self-sorting is one of these things where it's like, well, I don't want to live around all these Democrats, so I'm going to move to like West Texas. You know, I don't think it's like that. I think it's more like rural people live around rural people, and rural people have a certain set of interests that, for whatever reason, they in inclines them to the Republican Party. And families are divided as well. And one of the great events, I guess it was last week or the beginning of this week, Maureen Dowd um, had her brother uh, in the New York Times explain why he was for Trump. <laughs> And I told people that Donald Trump was everything my parents taught me not to be and everything we taught our, teach our daughter not to be. And my 36-year-old daughter called me up and said, Dad, I'm 36 years old. Can you say taught, not teach? <laughs> Very good. We are a divided country at the moment. That we can uh, agree on. Yeah. Even uh, with Maureen Dowd and her brother. I love it. <laughs> Other questions? Gentlemen, uh, thank you very much. Thank you, uh, thank you very much. For